overall uh, the parts of the urinary system. And the major parts, if we look here, let me make this a little bit bigger. The main parts are your kidneys, those are the star. And then you have two sets of kidneys. You also have a ureter, which is a tube that leads from your kidneys to your urinary bladder. Notice you have two kidneys, two ureters, and one urinary bladder. And lastly, the tube from the urinary bladder, which is a temporary storage of your urine, to the toilet is this, your urethra. Uh, remember, distinguish between your urethra and your ureters. Now, the diaphragm, uh, not, excuse me, the diaphragm is uh, the muscle, if you recall, from your um, laboratory that separates the thoracic from the abdominal contents. You will also remember that the kidneys were not located within the enclosure of the peritoneum. They were located behind the peritoneum, hence the term retroperitoneal location, meaning behind the peritoneum. You could also see here you have uh, every kidney has a renal artery and renal vein because remember it goes uh, blood goes in blood has to come out um, uh, supply of oxygen and other nutrients uh, goes in and we will also discuss the major filtering capabilities of the kidney as well and then you have here your descending aorta and we identified that as well to recap kidney ureter, two of them, two sets, one, two, one, two, and one of your urinary bladder and your urethra. You will also recall that the urethra in the female is much shorter than the urethra in the male, and hence its, uh, um, its susceptibility to um, uh, urinary tract infections. The urinary tract or the urinary pathway is that of the urethra, urinary bladder, and the ureter. When or if an infection or a problem gets up to the level of the kidneys, that is now a nephrology problem. That is now a kidney problem. We don't want to get it to that level because the kidneys are the star. And we'll show you why. Let's look at the previous page on 896 of your text. And if you can look here, there are bullet points, and all of them are the major functions of the kidney. Okay? They filter blood and plasma, excrete toxic metabolic waste, specifically, right here, nitrogenous waste. Now, nitro nitrogens, remember we talked about that um, in uh, metabolism, the, the change from food to fuel? Well, We've got extra nitrogens, we must maintain our nitrogen balance, we only can have so many nitrogens, so many of them have to get excreted. And if we look on the next page, let us see here, ammonia, urea, uric acid, and creatinine, these are our major nitrogen, nitrogenous wastes. They all have what in common? N, 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 nitrogen. Okay? So, uh, remember that proteins get broken down into carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, nitrogens. The excess nitrogens uh, will be discarded as waste. So that's the major function of the kidney. It's a filter. They regulate also blood volume. And re regulate water output because, you know, if you're thirsty, you tend to keep the water. And um, if, you know, drank way too much water, what do you do? You tend to urinate it out. Regulation of electrolyte and acid-base balance. Um, Acid-base balance deals with the hydrogen and the hydroxide ions. Remember, too many hydrogens, we have an acidic um, uh, solution. Too many hydroxide, we have a basic. We need to be where? Somewhere in the middle. And of course, since uh, the kidney is a major, um, um, it is a major filtering that mean, of the blood, that means it sees the blood every second. So the kidneys are one of the first organs that will sense that there is a depletion of blood or a, you know, um, a, low, a low count of blood. So if there's not enough blood, 
it sends a message the hormone to release the hormone erythropoietin and we discussed that hormone before and its function is to create red blood cells production of red blood cells they also regulate calcium they also clear hormones and drugs out of your blood they also detoxify free radicals now free radicals are uh, chemicals that you know um, that tend to react with other chemicals and we don't like so much reactivity um, uh, within our body we want to be aware we want to be in the middle we won't, won't want to be volatile moving either way they also do in, in extremes extreme starvation excuse me they also help us uh, to maintain blood glucose by synthesizing glucose from amino acids that's more of a minor point but you know if you're starving it's not necessarily a minor point but the major points are all up here blood volume uh, they filter electrolyte balance acid base balance all of these are um, very important parts of the kidneys and you could see why a UTI a urinary tract infection is something of concern but the greater concern is if the UTI is not resolved it will become a kidney problem and we don't want to have a kidney problem even though we have two of them yes you can survive with only one but again remember the machine was created with two and if you have one it cuts your efficiency by fifty percent alrighty next let us now uh, go now if these things ammonia urea uric acid and creatinine all the nitrogenous ways if they are not cleared from our system guess what we will have an increasing BUN blood urea nitrogen and then you will get something called azotemia okay that is when an elevated blood urea nitrogen azotemia means I've got too many nitrogens in my system I have too much waste right and then that could be of issue all right um, we already talked about uh, the position uh, oh yeah we didn't talk about the position well the position of your kidneys do understand that your right kidney is a little bit lower than your left kidney because of the um, uh, the presence of the liver on the right side let's look at the uh, outside anatomy it has a fibrous renal fascia and you'll remember that when from laboratory remember we moved it there was a skin and that extra skin or that extra layer is fascia and then um, we didn't see it so much in the fetal pigs because they're they're fetal pigs but as they grow there will be a fat capsule and all of that and also a fibrous capsule all of that is to protect uh, the kidney now if you recall from the laboratory they had like this little indentation part of like you know the the kidney shape let me show you here this little indentation right here that is called the hilum what structures are in the hilum let's look see the main part is the ureter remember the ureters go from the kidney all the way down to the urinary bladder now um, this is of course a real one versus a diagrammatic one um, but I just find it easy looking at the diagrammatic but once you see it for real at tomorrow's laboratory um, or Wednesdays for the Wednesday group well you'll see that um, it's got a lot of adipose, a lot of fat alright let's look at um, these also major structures as well you have a renal artery and a renal vein and that's also important because remember something has to bring the dirty blood in and then we clean it up we filter it and then any waste go down here and then the waste go out in the form of urine so urine production very important um, so we already know about the outside anatomy the hilum is this part and this is a beautiful all of the above question let's look at some of the filtering process so the filtering process starts all out here the blood goes in here right and then does what goes to the outer cortex this outer ring here that you can see here you can also see here is called your cortex and that has these things called nephrons nephron n-e-p-h-r-o-n and we'll be uh, describing that in greater detail just know that there are millions of them they're microscopic 
and um, they'll be filtering out your blood. Then they filter out, they keep the good stuff, the things that we want to keep, and then we throw out wastes, anything we don't want to keep. So you have here a major calyx, which is like a um, um, like a, a major, uh, it's like a funnel, it's the best way to put it. Um, this is a major calyx. All these little ones here are minor calyx or minor calyces. And of course you have your um, renal pyramids. In between these pyramids are columns. Okay, be able to use this picture, be able to identify this picture, and also definitely we will go, we'll be going through this in great detail uh, during our laboratory when we cut up a, quite a very large kidney. Okay, so these are the internal uh, parts of your kidney. Now, now that you know those parts, okay, and they're also listed in your notes, let us now describe the nephron. Here's a nice thing about circulation. On you know, leaves the aorta, goes all the way down here, and we're going to talk about more specific um, uh, arteries and veins. And uh, the arteries and veins, um, you have arcuate cortical, but that's that's not as important as what we're about to discuss in a moment, which is the filtering process, which is the main process. Look at here. This is the nephron. Okay, you have a cortical nephron and a juxtamedullary nephron. It doesn't, that doesn't mean much right now. Just know that cortex, cortical, per, al, pertaining to the cortex, and then you have the medullary region, which is all these bigger tubes. But essentially, the, um, the nephron, which is a microscopic thing, that is where the actual filtering, well, not only filtering, but three major processes occur during, um, during the uh, production of urine. So, the, one of the things that it has to do, it has to filter out the blood. That's number one. And then they have to absorb anything that got accidentally filtered out and then um, secrete anything that was accidentally um, uh, not thrown away. So you have reabsorption, meaning I have something of worth that I shouldn't have thrown out. And secretion... I have some waste that I should have uh, filtered, but it somehow still got in the blood. So there's like these two backup plays in progress. Um, you have the filtering first, that's the function of the nephron, and then you have two backup uh, systems in play uh, in the nephron, specifically in these loops right here, we're going to talk about in a moment. These loops and all these loops here. That you know, back up the filtering process because the filtering process is not 100%. Some good things get through, which we want to reabsorb. Some bad things don't get filtered out, which we want to secrete. Okay? Now, let's look at all the parts of uh, uh, your typical nephron. And let's look at this one um, because it's, it's just easier to look at. First, you have your glomerulus. Your glomerulus is a tuft or a little like dust bunny of uh, capillaries, which are the smallest uh, oxygenated, well, it becomes, it's the smallest part of gas exchange, and uh, um, where oxygenated and deoxygenated um, vessels meet, as you can see here. The red deoxygenated, I mean red oxygenated, the blue deoxygenated, and you'll see it forms a network here around the tubing. So the glomerulus is the main filtration point. After the glomerulus, it goes out on what is called a PCT, proximal convoluted tubule. Then, out of the proximal convoluted tubule, it will go down into the loop of Henle. After the loop of Henle, it goes through a distal convoluted tubule. After the distal convoluted tubule, it ends up here in this main collecting duct. A whole bunch of collecting ducts all get together, and guess what they empty into? They empty their pyramids. After the pyramids, remember what we saw in the larger macroscopic picture, after the pyramids, you have your major and minor calyxes, which then eventually dump all of that urine into your ureter. Okay? So you could see here that it goes from microscopic to macroscopic, starts in the cortex, but you could see here, starts in the cortex, but ends up in the 
medulla or the medullary area, which were the area of of uh, the pyramids and whatnot. So here is a, another example. Here's the cortex, and everywhere else here, that's all the medullary area. Okay. Alrighty, now you know the parts. Glomerulus, proximal convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule, and collecting duct. And right before it got to the collecting duct, it goes through this major water absorption and reabsorption right here, and that's your loop of Henle. So again, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and all ends up in a collecting duct. A whole bunch of collecting ducts end up in a renal pyramid. So it's like one big microscopic to macroscopic funnel. And what is it doing? Remember, the three processes that we talked about. Mainly, the glomerulus will filter. Then we have secretion, getting rid of anything that we forgot to filter out, and reabsorption, taking back things that we shouldn't have thrown out, but now because uh, that we need. So right now, while your heart is breathing, all of this is going on. As long as your heart is breathing, breathing, excuse me, um, you are making urine. Okay, so doo -doo 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 -doo, control of blood pressure. Um, let's go the next part, which is in our notes. We are now talked about urine production. Let's talk about normal urine. And here's a close-up more of the glomerulus. The glomerulus is a tuft of capillaries, and you can see here, and even here, while all these spaces um, are form like a filter. Here is the loop of Henle. Proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and through the collecting duct. And it all starts in the cortex, ends up in the uh, in the medulla, which is the inner portion. Okay. Let's look at this term real quick. I just peeped. GFR the glomerular filtration rate, or your GFR. <coughs> uh, many lab tests um, focus on GFR because it is um, the, the function of your kidney. If your glomerulus isn't fil filtering things right, well, then the, it's a major kidney problem. Okay. find normal urine. That's the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. I'm going to go over in a minute. I want to go over what is normal urine. What is normal urine? All right. I can't quite find it right now. But hey, how's this? You look it up. What's normal in urine? Essentially, this is how normal urine appears. Anything that's good should stay filtered within the body. Anything that's a, a, a waste, <coughs> excuse me, that's a waste product or too much of something, that's going to end up in the toilet. So, for example, blood is a good thing. You should never find blood in your urine. Unless what? What is the exception? You can look that up. Um... Sugar. If you eat a normal amount of sugar and not too much, right, the sugar should maintain and stay in your body. But because if, it, if I'm eating too much sugar, where will it end up? It'll end up in the toilet. Okay? And that is known as splay for the clinical personnel in the room. Let's go real quick through sympathetic control. Remember sympathetic fight or flight stimulus, right? An increase of blood pressure, increase of uh, heart rate. Let's look at I have a high GFR. Too much flow. Right? Rapid flow. Remember, we don't want to be too much. We don't want to be too little. Right? So what do we do? Certain, uh, you have a sensor here in your uh, in your macula densa, right? Which is uh, um, around the area of your arterioles. So it's going to sense that what? That's too high. 
So we're going to send out some hormones to do what? To tell them to do what? Slow it all down. And one way to slow it down is what? Decrease your heart rate or decrease your blood pressure. And remember, that's why we also get excited for anybody who has heart conditions or who has uh, high blood pressure because one of the major um, uh, organ systems that get uh, affected is your kidneys. Okay. Let us look at the renin angiotensin aldosterone model. This is on page 909. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's take a breather and, uh, and break this down. We already know that in uh, the, the gut peptide that there are hormones, uh, there are chemical signals in your body that control stuff. Well, the same thing when it deals with blood pressure. So here is an example. You have a drop in blood pressure. Your kidneys will sense it. You'll sen your kidneys will release the hormone called renin. Renin takes angiotensinogen and turns it into angiotensin 1. Angiotensinogen is from your liver. So you, uh, you have this enzyme, also known as a proenzyme, that's not activated. Angiotensinogen doesn't get activated until renin is present. Once renin is present, angiotensin 1 will get activated. Now, when I have angiotensin 1, uh, lungs will release ACE, or angiotensin converting enzyme. That'll turn angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. So what will it do? Remember, I have a drop in blood pressure. What do I need to do? I need to increase my blood pressure. So, of course, my brain gets message. So what's it going to do? Because it'll force me to drink some more. Remember, the tube, if it has more water in it, there'll be more pressure. Another thing that um, um, ACE angiotensin 2 does will increase my blood pressure through vasoconstriction. And then there's also another message to your adrenal cortex to release aldosterone to do what to your kidneys? It will sodium and water retention. Now, the trick about sodium retention is wherever salt goes, water goes. So if your body retains sodium, guess what's it going to do? It's going to retain water. Right? That's why ladies, that's why the obstetrician, uh, not obstetrician, the gynecologist always says, don't drink, um, uh, well, don't, uh, don't eat salty foods when you have your menses, right, when you're on your menstrual cycle, because what will it do? It'll make your bloating and cramping worse. Why? Anywhere that salt goes, water goes, right? So, all of that is in response to your uh, kidneys sensing that there's a drop in blood pressure. What kind of questions I'll ask? RAA, renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. I could ask you, where's renin from? From the kidney. Where is angiotensin from? It is uh, from the liver. And where is um, aldosterone from? It is from also your kidney. Well, actually, it is from your adrenal cortex, um, uh, your, uh, your adrenal gland, which is above your kidneys. Okay? So, renin, kidney. Angiotensin, liver and your aldosterone from your adrenal gland, which is on top of your kidney. What is the main function of the RAA system? Is to increase blood pressure when there is a drop in blood pressure, which the kidney senses. What ways will do it? What will the brain do? The brain will tell you, you are thirsty. What will uh, happen to your blood vessels? Your blood vessels will constrict. And what will happen to your sodium uh, and water retention? It will increase you will keep water uh, and you will also keep salt and from that picture there's so many questions I could ask even though it's just a single line on your notes you look page 909 major major thing and you know what let's have a quiz on it on um, uh, next Thursday when we have our review that's a beautiful beautiful picture and I should have a quiz to it so let's have that so prepare for that. Next, okay. I have some website with some great pictures of the kidney and kidney operation and nephron. They're also included in your notes, so go check that out. All right. Okay. Now that concludes um, the um, 
the urinary system. We're now we're going to go through the reproductive system. We're going to go through um, the male first because it's fast. And then we'll take a break and then uh, do the female because the female is is uh, uh, more, um, uh, there's more involved, more things involved. Okay, be back in one moment. Okay, and we are back. Uh, the notes I'm referring to uh, regarding uh, the lecture uh, that was missed by most today because of uh, the weather and the student appreciation stuff, but um, through the power of technology, uh, you get to have the lecture so you don't get to miss out. Um, urinary and production notes, uh, which are uh, here, and also um, just reproduction that has uh, pictures. Okay, so uh, let me just open that real quick. Just get that out there. And here are some pictures uh, that uh, we'll also be discussing during our um, um, our lecture regarding um, um, male and female reproduction. All right, so let's go on with the lecture. And the problem is we don't know how to use. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Dr. Garias again with the continuation of the male reproductive system. Now the notes for the male reproductive system. Um, again, we already discussed they're in two locations, and uh, let's get on with it. So. Um, page 1034 chapter 27 and let's just jump right into it looking at uh, the overview okay now when we were all babies not even babies usually around week six to eight age of gestation meaning to say is after the ovum and sperm have gotten together six to eight weeks after that there's something that starts called organogenesis or the creation genesis of uh, organ systems now all of us it'll be surprising to note to some of you it was surprising to note to me when I first learned it is that we all have the same stuff meaning to say because we were all born with items that could either become a male or either become a female. So we have here around five to six week embryo or five to six weeks age of gestation and you don't need to memorize what these things are but they're color coded and you could see that if your DNA in the, within the nucleus of all of your cells which is the blueprint of who you are states that you're going to be male then you'll develop down this, the blue. If it states you're female, you'll develop this way. And you will notice they're color-coded. See, there's items here, these items here, they match. These items here match these items here, and they match. So that is termed, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's late in the day today, everybody. So uh, bear with me. Um, those are termed homologs. Homo meaning the same. That means we all come from the same place. But then because of genetics, we have a set of hormones and we have a set of uh, uh, chemical messengers that make us male and the ones that make us female. So what are some of the homologs that are very common and um, that match up definitely? If you'll see here, the testes and the ovaries. Those are homologs. Ovaries, of course, house the eggs and the testes house the sperm. Because another homolog is the male penis and the female clitoris. And also part, also part and parcel, if you notice, they're all the same color. Of course, they have the same urinary bladder, but uh, the vaginal canal and the um, epididymis here of, not the epididymis, I'm sorry, uh, bubble urethral gland and the urinary bladder and also the urethra of the male, you could see that they're all homologs. They're the same. Okay? And of course, the homolog to uh, the male sperm is female ova. The homolog to the um, male testes is the female ovary. And the homolog to the male penis is the female clitoris. 
So you could see they're the same things, and we all come from the same place. But around week five to six, age of gestation, when you're about uh, six weeks embryo, um, you because of the hormones that are uh, that are released due to your DNA, these are the things you become. Now, if you look in our notes uh, regarding the male uh, reproductive system, we talked about primary and secondary sexual characteristics. Now, your primary sexual characteristics will be your DNA. What does your DNA say? So the primary sexual characteristics, so if it is chromosome XY, you get to be a male. Chromosome XX, you get to be a female. Now, how do you get these chromosomes? You get one from mommy and one from daddy. So if mommy gives you an X and daddy gives you a Y, guess what? You become a little boy. If mommy gives you an X and daddy gives you an X, you become a little girl. And those are primary sexual characteristics. And we'll be talking about situations where you think this can all get messed up and then you can't tell if it's male or female. So we always go down back to the blueprint of who you are. Now, what are your secondary sexual characteristics? Well, your secondary sexual characteristics are your that get developed through puberty. And according to my notes, you'll see here the glands penis, development of a penis versus development of a clitoris, right? And of course, um, I refer to uh, this particular diagram on page 1038, and there's also another diagram on page 1039. So, um, the secondary sexual characteristics are the things that you visibly see, okay? So primary characteristics is what is called your genotype, which is your XX or XY chromosome, right? And your um, uh, secondary char uh, sexual characteristics are the stuff that gets developed in uh, puberty. For example, female breast, tanner stages, right? There are different stages of breast development, and uh, and also you'll see that on a female uh, child, they'll have uh, specific areas where fat will develop, okay? Uh, more, more so on the hips to give uh, the more curvy figure. And for the male, it goes uh, more so uh, around the belly and also part and parcel of secondary sexual characteristics are, you know, the voice gets deeper and then, of course, uh, the increased um, yeah, muscularity um, in boys in puberty. So now let's go to, and again, this is a little introduction on how all of us were the same at one time, but then because of uh, uh, primary and secondary sexual characteristics, we developed. And here's the other uh, picture where you could see the homologs even better, and you could see it's the same. So the clitoris, part of the penis. The labia, which are the folds we'll be talking about when we talk about female anatomy. They also are folded different to make the male penis. All right? So you can see we're both the same thing, but this is now well into uh, six to seven weeks age of gestation um, for an embryo. Okay? So what kind of questions could I ask you? What is a primary uh, sexual characteristic? What's a secondary sexual characteristics? What are the homologs? What are the things that, um, you know, um, um, uh, that come from the same uh, uh, source tissue material? Alrighty. Here's the development of uh, male sexual organs. And let's go to... External and internal male anatomy. Okay. This picture, uh, let me see if I have, if it's the right one. Ten, uh, page 1041, figure 27.7, it's this. So you should know some of these major uh, uh, organs. And I have a more simpler picture that's in the, the notes on Moodle. But you could see here, of course, the head of the penis is called the glands, and of course foreskin, uh, if the uh, patient is circumcised, that of course gets remuse, removed, and it's also known as your prepuce. You also have here 
uh, some uh, deep veins and, and cords that are in here and that is also what uh, the filling up of those veins uh, is what gives uh, the patient um, uh, an erection. Now again we also talk about uh, remember the two types of signals you have in your body uh, one type is hormonal and the other type is of course neural so both need to be in play in order for uh, the male sexual organ to be uh, erect or another term you might hear is timescent right so let's see testes of course here you have your epididymis which is uh, part of a whole bunch of cords your tunica vaginalis now what cords do you really need to know you know we could sit here and memorize all these but just to understand that um, testes is enough of course uh, the penis and of course all of it gets put together through fascia. Um, you also have your external inguinal ring and I'm going to talk about that uh, real quickly because the development of the testes, remember the ovaries are all the way up in the abdominal cavity. Um, the testes at one time was also in the abdominal cavity just like um, um, the female counterpart but eventually they uh, develop and move down and while they move down, they create a pathway and with all these cords and all these things that comes down with it. Now, another thing of note here is the cremaster muscle. Now, uh, you may hear that vulgar joke that, oh, how's it hanging? And they're hanging low or hanging high? Well, we all know that when it gets really, really hot, they'll hang low. When it gets really, really cold, they will hang very close to our body who controls that is the cremaster muscle. It is a reflex because the testes here is the factory for sperm. And that factory has an optimal um, um, operating temperature. So if it's too hot, the cremaster muscle will relax and allow the testes go, uh, uh, with uh, and all the related structures to do what? Drop. Um, so maybe you've heard in fertility clinics that they say, um, you know, one way to improve your fertility is to um, wear uh, looser clothing and also uh, wear, you know, boxers versus tidy whities or briefs. Well, that's partially true because, again, back to the optimal operating temperature. So if it's too warm, it goes, we have to uh, let the testes uh, let the testes hang. But you've also um, seen and maybe have heard that when it gets really, really cold, they, uh, the cream master muscle will pull the testes up closer to the abdominal cavity, which will then do what? Warm them up. Because there has to be an optimal operating temperature. And remember, it's all just about um, our body likes to be where? In the middle. Okay? So some of the. Um, some of the features are, of course, the inguinal ring. You can get a hernia from that. And a hernia is simply the, pro uh, the material that's supposed to be behind this wall sometimes stick out, and then that's when it hurts. You know, that's where you get that classic, uh, you know, when, the, um, when they always say on commercials or on, or on TV shows where uh, the doctor has his hand on um, the, the patient's testes, you know, turn to your left and cough. We don't really do that anymore. But there's other ways and other strategies where uh, we can uh, identify um, hernias and other things like that. So those are some of the external structures. Now, let's look at some of the internal anatomy and also some of the tubing. I, I glossed over some of the tubing uh, because it's a little bit... Um, doesn't that's not a good picture to to really look at there you go this is a much much better picture it's on page 1045 and it's figure 27.11 and um, it's a prettier picture uh, but the pictures that I have in the other parts of the notes kind of make it look more uh, look a little bit simpler <coughs> now of course you have two if you look at this picture down here Of course, you have two, testi two testes, and you have, of course, uh, this tube here, which is identified as your ductus deferens, and it goes up and around, 
and of course this is your urinary bladder and you can see here where the sexual function also kind of gets married or melted in with the um, uh, uh, the urinary functions and you remember this bulb here from previous lecture which is your urinary bladder you can also see the prostate gland here and we're going to talk about the prostate gland and what they do is uh, what they do as well all right and of course the penis glands penis and you could see there are all these caverns or all these spaces here they get and of course in order for um, the patient to become erect because there has to be good um, good blood flow which is by the way that's actually how we found out about Viagra and stuff because Viagra the little blue pill that helps uh, our male patients with erections was actually uh, uh, originally thought of for an antihypertensive drug but then they saw this wonderful side effect and it will do what it will uh, lower the blood pressure just enough so that blood can fill all these cavern the, these little spaces and have um, the patient can have an erection. Now you can also see how uh, that uh, ductus deferens also is incorporated here uh, in the urinary bladder. You can also see why uh, we have to have rectal examinations for our male patient because there's pretty much no way for me to get at that prostate. But if I uh, digitally insert a finger, a gloved finger, of course, of course you lubricate it, I hope, and then you can see here, so if there's any cancer or anything here, I could feel it from here. So that's also another reason why uh, uh, um, in the male and also the female patients. Now, of course, male patient has a prostate gland, female patient does not. But we also do rectal examinations on a female patient because there's also a way to get at uh, spaces that you can't get to from the front and you can see here this is night you can actually feel if this is not smooth then there's something going on here let's go back to of course the scrotum which is the sac that holds uh, the testes and then you have your epididymis here and then of course your ductus deferens and it goes all the way up around and it goes through your prostate and then your prostate then connects up so there's two tubes one tube here that will be your urethra, right? And in the male, the urethra shares two functions. Not only a urinary function, but a sexual function for delivery of um, um, sperm. Okay? So you got to know those tubes. Of course, this is the rectum, which is part of your digestive tract, right? And then, your, of course, your anal sphincter here. And you have to know that uh, this is your urinary bladder. And you can see how your urinary bladder and your uh, the tube that leads from your testes kind of connect and you could see how if my patient has any prostatitis or prostate cancer or any trouble with the prostate you could see it's going to give it problems with what sexual function and also urination which is our the two classic signs and symptoms of any prostate issues okay and Ren again prostate gland is only for the male patient all right Next. Now, you can see that the prostate gland and you also have uh, the Cowper's gland, also known as the bulbo-urethral gland. Now, they, uh, these glands serve uh, a significant purpose. Let me see if we can find uh, the description and on what page. Let me get to the, oh, here, here, here you go. Right here on the prostate gland. We already know uh, what the uh, prostate gland is, but then we, uh, we have to know uh, not only where it is, but what does it do. And with the bulbo-urethral glands, right, um, they do certain things. Now, one of the things, of course, what the bulbo-urethral gland does, it, um, wait a minute, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Okay, all right, there are some glands and the prostate. Now the prostate gland uh, helps, um, um, uh, helps prepare the sperm uh, for delivery along with the bulbo urethral gland. 
Now, the bulbo urethral gland is highly specific because it helps lubricate the head of the penis in preparation for sexual intercourse. And also, it, goes, it neutralizes the acidity uh, uh, of, uh, of the urine and also of the surrounding area. Because remember, the va oh, well, well, you don't remember yet, but we're going to be talking about the vaginal canal and how actually it has, uh, it is an acidic environment. And that acidic environment, its function, just like the acid in your stomach, is not as acidic as the acid in your stomach, but it does the same thing by um, providing an antimicrobial environment. The problem is, during sexual intercourse, that's not a very good environment for the sperm to be in. It'll kill off a lot of the sperm. So the prostate gland <coughs> and the bulbar urethral gland, it goes, will provide uh, um, the fluid medium that is also a little bit on the uh, alkaline side, which is basic side, right, to balance everything out so not all the sperm gets killed. Another thing that it does, it also provides uh, glucose as energy for the sperm. Um, and uh, it also provides, uh, you know, uh, a more uh, uh, slippery fluid so that there's natural lubrication so, uh, so that there will be uh, um, uh, continued sexual intercourse all the way up to, of course, ejaculation. So those are some of the glands and those are some of the things. And we already talked about the relationship between blood pressure and erectile function and dysfunction. So those are the accessory glands and um, some within the seminal vesicles, prostate gland, and your bulbal urethral gland that looks like and sounds like a beautiful all of the above question. So know the pictures, know the basic external anatomy, know the basic internal anatomy with concentration of these tubes. And um, now let's go to female anatomy. Nucleolus. Nucleolus? Yeah, it's like, let me write it on the board.